Welcome to the Kennedy Report. I'm Kennedy Hall. What would Fulton Sheen have to say about the modern rainbow movement, the pride movement? You know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, he was an Orthodox Catholic bishop. He believed the teachings of the faith. So I'm sure you can imagine the types of things that he believed. But did he ever comment on the actual things that we're going through right now, or at least in his time, which was the preceding stuff that uh, to what we're going through right now? And in fact, he did. And we're going to go through some clips from one of his episodes of his show from back in the day. Uh, and you're going to watch, you're going to want to watch until the end. And the reason is, he says something in this episode that I've put at the end of our video that you will not hear from bishops today. You wish you would, but you won't. It's such a simple truth. If a bishop could come out and say something like that today, especially a mainstream bishop, it would probably break the internet. Before we get to that, though, I want to thank our sponsors over at Noble Gold. Now is the time to set goals for the next cycle of inflation. This way you're always moving forward, you're growing, you're making money, you're not losing it. Imagine if you do this, you'll have more financial freedom, which gives you, let's face it, more fun. Start a gold IRA with Noble Gold now and fight inflation. And this month for every IRA above 20K, you'll get an incredible three ounce silver American virtue coin that has a cash value to it. And you'll get that completely free as a thank you. You can't go wrong with Noble Gold. Call 1-877-646-5347. That's 1-877-646-5347. Call that number now to find out more. Or visit noblegoldinvestments.com. All of the information you need is linked in the description to this video. Thank you again to Noble Gold. Okay, so what would Fulton Sheen have to say about the Pride Rainbow phenomenon? Well, he has an episode called The Sex Revolution. We call it the sexual, sexual revolution, but, you know, people call it different things. And this was from his show Life is Worth Living from, from uh, the 1960s. Uh, and I actually found an episode of it, in, of it in color, digitally remastered, so it's pretty good. And uh, he goes through the deeper cultural reasons why we're even going through something like this. And I, I made a bunch of notes from there because I want to make sure we get them, uh, get everything we need out of that because it's really profound. And in this, this is clip one that we're going to watch. And he explains what he believes are the reasons behind the sexual revolution and how much deeper they actually go. So we'll just watch this clip here together. We've been inclined to label it sex revolution. Is it really that at all? I doubt it very much. There's all, there have always been revolutions of this kind in history. But I think instead of it being a sex revolution, it's a culture revolution that we have. Sex is merely the manifestation of a crisis that we have in our culture. Our times are those in which people are full of frustration, anxiety, fear, and dread. They're lonely. They've broken off all bonds. With hmm. He says there that the nature of what's behind the sexual revolution is actually a cultural revolution. This is really important. He says the wor uh, that this cultural revolution is behind the sexual revolution and we need to understand what that means, this word culture. The word culture actually comes from a word cultus. This is where we get the word cult. I know we don't want to say we're in a cult, but historically, this word cult means a religious group. Um, so when you talk about something or a place having a culture, what it really means is um, what is the religious foundation of that place? Um, so... Uh, if we think about what was happening in the 1960s, well, we have a revolution happening in the Catholic Church. And this is not my opinion. This is not just some, you know, rad trad opinion about what happened. These are the words of one of the foremost so-called reformers of the Second Vatican Council. His name was Cardinal Suenens. And he said that at Vatican II, this was the French Revolution in the Church. Archbishop Lefebvre elaborated on this in his book, Open Letter to Confused Catholics. And he wrote, 
It was Cardinal Suenens who exclaimed, Vatican II is the French Revolution in the Church. And among other unguarded declarations, he added, One cannot understand the revolution, the French or Russian revolutions, unless one knows something of the old regimes which they brought to an end. It is the same in church affairs. A reaction can only be judged in relation to the state of things that preceded it. What preceded and what he considered due for abolition was that wonderful hierarchical construction culminating in the Pope, the Vicar of Christ on Earth. He continued, The Second Vatican Council marked the end of an epoch, and if we stand back from it a little more, we see it marked the end of a series of epochs, the end of an age. So, one of the foremost reformers at the Second Vatican Council was very open about what happened at the Second Vatican Council. He talked about it being the end of an age. Uh, he talked about it being um, the French or Russian, like the French or Russian Revolution. <laughs> uh, these, uh, that something having been abolished because of what had happened. That's not the way the church is supposed to operate. We don't abolish the traditions. We build on them. So it shouldn't be any wonder that we've gone through a cultural and sexual revolution in the same decade historically that the church herself was having what one of her prelates, one of her cardinals, called a French revolution within the church. Fulton Sheen also says, this has happened because we've broken off all bonds with the eternal. It's been said in other places, and I must reiterate it, without God, ultimately all things are permissible. If there's no eternity, then there's no eternal purpose, there's no um, consequence after you die for the way that you've lived. There's no judgment. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's just nothing. If that's the case, then it really doesn't matter what you do while you're here. You take this sort of vaguely evolutionary look where we do things because of our basic purposes for the species, but even then those are kind of subjective depending on who you ask. So really, you, you can do whatever you want at the end of the day if there's no God. And um, anyone who tells you otherwise is, is, is either ignorant or not telling you the truth. He goes on and he explains the difference, though, between our age, where we have moral revolutions and immorality, and he goes at the difference between our age and the ages prior. Because definitely there have been ages in the past where there were moral revolutions, but there's a difference between ours, and he explains exactly what that is. Yes, there's been this kind of immorality in the past. But this difference between the past and the present. In the 14th, 15th century, there was a breakdown of morals. So much so that it brought on the religious revolution. So there's a breakdown of morals today. But in those days, People knew they did wrong. They didn't call the wrong right. Today, when there's a cancer, we call it health. Men stole in those days, and some of them were just as rotten as they are today. But they always believed in a moral order. And that's the reason when individuals fell, civilization did not. Think of the time period that he was talking about there. He's talking about the 14 and 1500s, and there was a moral decay that led to a religious revolution. He's talking about the Protestant Revolution. But he illuminates this key difference. Yes, the morals of people have gone kind of back and forth. But the perceptions about what is moral and what is not moral has not had the same kind of change that it has in the last 50 or 60 years in our society. And if we think about that period with the uh, Protestant Rev uh, Revolution, we think of Luther, for example. He admitted there was sin, um, but he believed that we were ultimately saved by our faith alone. So sinning, although not a good look, was not something grave that would damn your soul for all eternity as long as you had sufficient faith. And this led to the idea, or this is a precursor to the idea, let's say, of total depravity, which is very common amongst Calvinists. 
So this is the idea that we're completely beyond redemption uh, other than the sacrifice of Christ. There's obviously a truth in that, but we believe in the church with our sacraments that grace can perfect nature. This is what we have our saints. So if you follow this total depravity idea out all the way, you get to this idea that, you know, we can really do nothing except believe and ultimately, as long as we have faith, we'll act as if we have faith and Christ will save us in the end. But even with those false religious beliefs, they still didn't deny that there was sin. They just excused it away. You see the difference there? It wasn't Luther saying, you know, the, Ca the Catholic Church is wrong about sin because there is no sin. It was the Catholic Church is wrong about um, what can be done about sin. There is still sin, and he even said sin boldly. Um, in context, I understand that. Um, but in those days, there was no idea that there was no such thing as sin. It was just justified differently while still calling it sin. It's a very important distinction. Uh, they would still say things like so-and-so is a good man because he acts in a good way because they believed in good. Um, they would not say in those days that you could change your identity. They would not say that you could change your biology. And they would not say that you could make day into night or anything of the sort because they still believed in the natural law. Sheen goes on to explain um, how sexual immorality, as dangerous as it is for the culture, it's especially dangerous for the youth. And he illuminates something here that's really important. It's a little bit of a longer clip, but pay attention here because what he says is striking. First of all, it's a kind of a, a cultural revolution because this immorality among the young is almost a question of status. Status. Uh, girls in colleges, in high schools, for example, will, will boast among other girls of their immorality, look down upon others who have not been immoral, because they seem to put themselves in a superior position. Boys in like manner will boast of how many girls they have ruined. You see, the primary interest, really, does not seem to be in sex. If it were, they wouldn't take this attitude of seeking to achieve status. Oh, they're different, they're bigger. And they feel so uncomfortable, they show a disdain for anyone else. And then, too, from another point of view, sex has become very, very intellectual. It's talked about, it's written about, it's advertised as the subject of every film, book, and so forth. In other words, it has gone out of the area of the body and has got up into the brain so that it has become an obsession. There's so much there that's profound of what he said. He absolutely nails it here in clip number three that we just watched. It's not just about the releasing of some natural urge. Everyone understands that there is a natural urge for something like sexual activity. Of course there is. There's a natural urge for natural things. It's about more than that with the revolution. It's about the status of a man. He uses the, the, the first the analogy of young girls. But then he goes on to say something that I think is so important. He says, you know, men will boast of how many young ladies they've ruined. And that's what it, when you're a predator like that, and, and if you're, you know, out there looking for virgins or things because you think you're cool by doing that, you're ruining young women and you should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, it's a status symbol. This is why it's sold. You see, the the, re the way that we know that sexuality is promoted and has been promoted throughout this time of revolution as something to do with status is the fact that it's sold to us. This old expression that sex sells. Well, what you're selling people is an experience. What you're selling people is, you know, think about it. I mean, you could sell toothpaste or paper or pens or, I don't know, some sort of pop 
you're American, you call it soda, but that's okay. We all have we all have faults. Um, why on earth would you need to sell a sexual experience? Because what you're selling is this idea that if you have this product, you're going to be part of this group of people that is a, of a higher status because they're like this, what you want to be like. This is the result of the sexual revolution, okay? Um, this is why it has to be encouraged as part of being cool. Uh, and this is ultimately why it has to be promoted to kids. And we're going to talk specifically about how it corrupts kids in a bit. Um, and the fact that it's promoted is also evidence of the fact that people know it's wrong. You see, we think today, we see these like parades that go on and we say, oh, look, they're just looking for justification for their activities. The parade is just the culmination of what was happening long before that. The fact that you would have to have, you know, so-and-so awarded in a movie or something like that for being some sort of sexual triumphant figure, it's still adulation. It's still um, approving, public approval of what this guy has done. Um, these shows like Sex and the City, they're the same thing. Anything where, where people are trying to get approval, adulation, respect, being applauded for uh, their deviant behavior, no matter the type, this is of the same psychology. He's also prophetic how he mentions that it has to be part of academia and being intellectual. Isn't that the case? Only old school and less sophisticated, backward people would hold to uneducated ideas like marriage is between a man and a woman. Smart, educated people know better, don't they? That's the message we get in our culture. Ultimately, he's right. It is an obsession. People can't think about anything else. My goodness gracious, you can't walk down a grocery store aisle without coming, <laughs> coming up against some sort of magazine that in days past would have been called pornographic, but today it's called a health magazine. It's just absurd. People are obsessed with it, and they need everyone else to validate their obsession. So here is another clip. It's clip four, and he gets to the heart, the heart of what we would call the pride movement today, very specifically. Can you imagine if a bishop would talk like this on TV today? Naked. And the final suggestion that it is cultural is the fact that there's so much perversity attached to this so-called sex revolution. The glorification of homosexuality, perverseness, murder is associated with it, unnatural crime. Sex doesn't decorate itself with those things, but a bad culture. Well, we know exactly what he's talking about there. Why does he speak about unnatural crimes in relation to sexual activity? The thing is, is Fulton Sheen, as a, you know, old school Catholic intellectual, he understands the natural law. He speaks about it frequently in his works. I'll give you an example. You have a human nature and you have certain functions uh, that your body is geared towards. So for example, you feel hunger because you have to eat. And why do you have to eat? So you don't starve, so you don't die. That's baked into the cake. So you have this natural urge to eat. Now, you know how that works. You eat your food, you chew your food, you digest your food, and therefore, your food does what it's supposed to do. But if somebody had an eating disorder where they would eat the food and then choose not to digest the food, but instead to expel the food or regurgitate the food, we would call that, like I said, a disorder. It's not because there's anything wrong with the person in a sense where we think they're lesser than anyone else, but we would call it that because there's a natural order of eating. And what happens when you frustrate that order as you go against the order you put it out of order which we would call a disorder it's just a technical term well in the same way there is a natural urge in human beings it's not the same as eating you don't have to partake in sexual activity in order for you to survive the same way you have to eat but it's close enough for the sake of analogy human beings are made with a certain body male and female and they interact with each other in a certain way 
And when they do that with the natural order of things and don't frustrate it, then we have the propagation of children. Now, there are ways that someone could use the human body in a sense that goes against the natural order. And it might give that person certain psychological pleasures that they were looking for. But if it's not done within the order of how the body was made, then we would call it a disorder. And this is what we would call unnatural. So when he, thinks, when he speaks about things pertaining to alternative sexual lifestyles as being unnatural, he's speaking in a very technical sense here. And he's illuminating something that for centuries was understood by everyone. Um, it's just astonishing that in our day, you know, to even say these sorts of things in your local parish, especially, or in a school, uh, would somehow be seen as hate speech or something like that, which is just crazy because when you hear it explained in a very technical sense, I think it sounds pretty tame and pretty sensible. Well, he goes on in more detail to explain the dangers of sexual education, sex ed, and why it corrupts children. This is in clip number five. Now, when we just communicate this, the physical, and we leave out the spiritual and the atmosphere of love. Well, when we do that, then we have children saying, well, there's no difference between, uh, uh, between uh, a boy and a girl and between animals. After all, do not they have identically the same physiological processes? And since we're just animals, and who doesn't get that impression simply by treating the physical, since we're just animals, why not act like an animal? If we came from the beast, well, let's act like beasts. Hmm. If we came from the beasts, let's act like beasts. This is a critique of materialism and evolutionism. It shows the dangers of reducing things to mere matter and to the animal, as human beings are more than that. We're not just body, we're body and soul. We have a rational soul. People do act like beasts today, I would say. Um, the way that they treat each other, the way that they use each other. And I really enjoy in this clip how he talked about the atmosphere of love. See, the thing is, it's hard for us, it's hard for schools to teach sex education properly because it's outside, as he says, of the atmosphere of love, which is a very mysterious thing. And ultimately we, ultimately, we understand love in the fullest sense as Christians, as love is life-giving. So if you take away the life-giving aspect through sterility, contraception, um, uh, you know, uh, um, non-traditional alternative, we're trying to stay on YouTube here, non-traditional alternative lifestyle choices, where the propagation of another person is frustrated or impossible because the act itself can't do it, then it's outside of the atmosphere of true love. It doesn't mean it's outside the atmosphere of affection. People have affection for a lot of things. I have affection for people that are not related to me, but it's different than the affection you have for somebody who's in your immediate family, for example. Affection can come in degrees. People can have sexual attraction to lots of different people, lots of different situations, but ultimately, if you truly love somebody, the atmosphere of love will be life-giving, as that is true Christian love at the end of the day. There's one last clip here where I told you to watch till the end of the video because Fulton Sheen tells a simple truth uh, that you probably won't hear from your bishop. Maybe you will if you got a bishop like Bishop Strickland or Bishop Schneider or something like that. Um, but we're going to end with this part here because he says it just like it is. Well, what is the nature of sex? Sex has a double element. Sex is a mystery. What is the known thing about sex? Well, the known thing is that everybody's male or female. Yep. Well, Jean said it. So... You want to know the roots of the sexual revolution? Look into Fulton Sheen. You want to know what he thinks about the pride movement of our day? Well, now you know. Uh, in many ways, he was a prophet, wasn't he, of our times. And uh, 
God bless him for that. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Please like this video, subscribe to this channel, visit the links in the description to help our sponsor, Noble Gold. They've been so gracious to uh, reach out to us and it's just been a wonderful relationship. Also, you can find out how to support the channel. You can sign up for Patreon. You can just donate. You can just, if you say, I don't want to do this Patreon thing, whatever, okay, fine. We, we can accept donations any other way. Uh, in addition, there is this function through YouTube now where I believe you can just press the give thanks, which is just the same idea, donate through our, our YouTube account. There are lots of options. I appreciate the help uh, from everyone who supported us. Makes this possible. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.